moment. If you read this, you'll see that there are three ancient types of speech in Roman and Greek drama, and it pertains to an ancient Roman law that a citizen is granted three opportunities to speak in their defense. Prolocution being the first, or prologue. Colocution being the second. Colocution is equivalent to, uh, where are we? Uh, is to a dialogue or monologue and epilogue being adlocution being the third and final opportunity. So adlocution from an ancient principle is effectively the third and final opportunity to speak in your defence. Well, we've reached the end of the hour. Uh, we've had a number of technical faults. It threw me a bit in my dialogue with you tonight and I apologise for those. Hopefully next week we won't have those kind of uh, interferences. I did want to spend that time in terms of the upcoming uh, discussion and presentation of the uh, next presentment in August of the financial system. I did want to show you in a bit more detail some of the updates that have been done in terms of positive law, but have run out of time. Unfortunately, the canons are taking time, but then again, uh, these things are being done in days and weeks compared to years, decades and centuries. It will be finished and it must be finished by October because, of course, at the end of October, the third presentment of this year before judgment at the end of the year will be to the law, to the rule of law and canon law. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience. Again, I'm sorry for the interruptions tonight and the breaking of the flow, but I look forward to your questions. I look forward to your support. I thank all those that continue to help. Uh, all help is appreciated. And I look forward to those that will be uh, nominating and offering their assistance for the package for August. So now I'm going to take questions that you've got in terms of uh, in the chat and anyone that would like to speak live by pressing star eight on the dialogue and uh, hopefully we will get that uh, up as well. So I'm just gonna look through and see if I can see questions and then uh, I look to see if any of you would like to speak by pressing star eight, I think it is, on the uh, call. Okay, uh, let's have a look and see questions here. All right, I have a question here uh, from Josh Aber which says, uh, what, what if the do heal and do admit to their wrongs and do the right thing? Uh, I'm assuming you say, what if they do heal and do admit to their wrongs and do the right thing? Um, look, the, ho the hope in all of what we do is that when I sp speak of writing to the Queen of England or Benedict or anybody, uh, I don't seek to judge, and I hope you don't seek to judge the the people you deal with, but you focus on the system. The war that we're in, or the battle we're in, the war is over, but the battle we're in is with ideas. The reason the world is the way it is, is because of bad, corrupt, selfish ideas. People intrinsically are all born the same. We're born as babies, we grow up, and... This is why we, we describe people who are doing the wrong thing as being infected by a mind virus because that's exactly what it is. The minute you put a label on someone and say that someone is bad because they were born in Kazakhstan or someone is bad because they're a member of a Venetian family, then you're putting a label that has no remedy. You're accusing people that has no way of healing. And in fact, when you do that, you are creating an enemy that has no choice but to fight for its life. Well, it may be a fact that someone is born into a family and because that family happens to promote mental illness, that that is a self-perpetuating system. And that, of course, is the case with bankers. The banking families have interbred. The banking families have maintained their madness. And because of that, when one talks of these elite banking families, you are dealing with part of the problem. But that is not a justification to attack 
the man or the woman. Everyone has a choice. But our issue is with the mind virus. Our issue is with the madness. Okay. I have a question here from guest 29. Did ancient Celtic people tattoo? Are tattoos bad in general, spiritually, energetically? That's a very, very good question. There is a school of thought that says that tattoos are negative and that comes mainly from the uh, Ur, Syrian and from the Mithraic and the uh, Yahudi school. And the reason it comes from a negative is the connotation of tattoos in those cultures. There is anecdotal evidence, not hard evidence, that in the structure of the Sumerian states, and in particular the philosophies of Ur that went on to be used in uh, North Syria and became part of the claims of the uh, Sumerians and Sumatians, and of course the creation of the Talmud and the Phoenicians is that they tattooed the population as animals. They branded the population as animals. And this is one of the negative connotations. Certainly there is historical evidence that points to the Phoenicians uh, tattooing, the Phoenician families tattooing their populations, particularly in the city of Tyre, that's T-Y-R-E, the city of Tyre, where they were branded as animals, tattoos, numbered. And the only other time we saw these numbered tattoos in the present day was, of course, in the camps uh, for sacrificing people in World War II. So that is a stream of thought that sees tattoos as negative. And, of course, in Rome, the prostitutes and the condemned were tattooed and slaves were tattooed. But there is a counterculture in terms of tattoos where tattoos were considered a rite of passage. They were considered a mark of status and they were considered in many cases a granting of power, a transference of power. And I refer to the tattooing um, of the tribes in Africa and the tattooing of the Polynesian tribes the tattooing in the ancient cultures of Olmec and the ancient cultures of the Americas, where far from tattooing being considered a curse, the uh, tattoos were considered absolutely a bestowing of greater authority, a re recognition of a rite of passage, and were considered of great esteem. So that's a long-winded answer, and I think the short answer is, yes, I do believe that the Celts and certainly the ancient Celt uh, tribes participated as all the great uh, wisdom keepers of the indigenous cultures participated in tattoos being a sign of esteem. And our good old friends from Ur and those that viewed knowledge as a way of cursing control were the purveyors where they considered cursing, uh, sorry, tattoos as a way of control. So the short answer is yes, I, I do believe they did. So that was a long-winded answer. Um, I can see uh, one here would like to talk. This is Darwin Bourne. So I'm going to take Darwin Bourne now just to speak with him. And then if anyone else wants to speak who's on the call, please press um, star eight. I see Alpha 999 is up there too. So I'm going to uh, unmute Darwin Bourne. Here we go. Hi, Darwin Bourne. Can you hear us? Yeah, good day. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, beautiful. I'm sitting with a couple of elders, and uh, as I wrote down the question, I was just wondering if the if the if the mobs are able to sit down as a mob in council, whether or not that they need to. Uh, to apply or utilise all the uh, actual physical form of the Eucadian society 
Well, I ask this is because um, uh, I don't know whether or not you got a chance to view any of the postings that I put up in regard to Indigenous law here in the Territory and some of the mobs that have already put forward their case in the courts and through the governments. Um, but uh, I, I find a lot of the people within the communities, they, they already have family that are within the greater community and nobody really is interested in uh, disrupting the, uh, the greater system. So that, that's why uh, working through the Acadian society is, is a, applicable. Just as I said last week, it can be a little bit difficult to get everybody up to competency and we understand that we can make representation through council and claim the other people. But I was just wondering whether it's possible to be a member, a part of the Acadian Society, as council, as a council of elders of all the different mobs, without actually going through all the physical processes in the in the courts and with the government, with the land title officers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, to whether we can actually enact something as council uh, in the original form um, of law, as sitting down as a mob and, and coming to a uh, a, a, a form of, uh, of of legal resolution as to what our community's needs are. Absolutely. And look, I think th I'm very, very excited that you asked that question because the, the, the answer, the short answer is yes. Yes, you can. And, and let me share with you something uh, that goes to the heart of what, what I feel Eucadia can do and what has been missing. Uh, if you look at the index page of uh, Positive Law, have you got that up on a web browser at all? Have you been able to see that uh, in the discussion uh, tonight? Well, I'm on. Uh, I, I can have a go. It's just I'm on one of those. Uh, we're on one of those uh, mobile things. So I'll get worried if I start don't, don't, don't worry then. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. Don't worry because you might drop off. No, no. Yeah. What I wanted yeah. to share with you is that. Article 240, what we've done in positive law and what will be finished by next week. So this is something I look forward to showing you next week. But under 7.3 of positive law, we have introduced a new, a new section called systems of law. And this was not present before. That is to describe different historical systems of law. Now the difference between a system of law and merely a form of law, for example, Admiralty law is merely a form of law. It's not a system. A system is uh, a, a structure that covers all aspects of the function of a society from its origin, from the creation, from the administration, from the uh, enforcement uh, and the uh, balancing of that society. So it must cover areas including, of course, the electing of elders. It must include, of course, trade and commerce. It must include uh, birth and families and relationships. It must include defence and all the other aspects. A system of law must cover that whole complex array of a complex society. You follow? Yes. Okay. Now... When you have a look at that, you'll see, of course, a range of different descriptions. You'll see international law, common law, feudal law, civil law, Anglo-Saxon law, Roman law. These will all make sense, I hope, for anyone looking and saying, of course. And then, of course, we have older law forms like Persian law and Vedic law from, from India and Ixos law and Babylonian law. These, again, I hope people will see make sense. But the first three systems of law that you will see the first is a law form called atoll and the word atoll is in recognition of uh, the indigenous of the americas now the atoll uh, indian still exists on the plains there in the antis mountains or the andes mountains they're called the andes mountains now but they're also called the antis mountains the atoll indians are still there today and they have some very, very ancient practices. I don't know if they still uh, do them. But in the forms of their boats, all these things have cultural connections to Egypt, to Asia, to the world. And in fact, the sculptures of the Olmecs and others all points to being descendants of the, of the atoll. The atoll, if you like, being uh, a way of describing an ancient law form of tens of tens of thousands of years old. 
And then the second below that, 